Well, I want to welcome everyone to our first night on our class on biblical prosperity. This is our first night. We're going to be going over uh, our class syllabus. My name is Richard Stewart. I'm one of the pastors of our ministry online training center. And uh, we're going to have a class on biblical prosperity. So this is prosperity that is going to be taught from a biblical perspective. And as we go over the syllabus and, and maybe look at some of the things that we're going to be studying over the next 10 weeks, I want you to know that you're going to have uh, 10 different teachers, which is really unique to our school as far as I know, that we're having different teachers so that the Holy Spirit can teach you through different vessels and different teaching styles. And it's all designed for your edification, to build you up, to give you confidence in the fact that the Lord has called you. He knew your personality when he called you. He knew you when he called you. He knows you now, and you will be effective ministering to those people that the Lord places you before. Because he knew who he was calling. He knew how you were from the start. He knew how you spoke, how you sound, your education level. He knew all of those things and he still called you. So what I want you to do is have the confidence to know that since he called you, he will equip you and he will be with you while you're ministering. So we just want you to relax, take these lessons and study them. They're all going to be videotape lessons, so you can take the time to study them at your own pace. They're online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you study them during the time that you have available. And utilize the technology. Take the time to stop the video, to research and look up scriptures, to, to, to have your Bible beside you, to take notes and to replay them. and. Uh, so you can get for yourself a set of notes that you can use that will help you to study or to present the lessons to the people God set you before in the future. In fact, uh, for the last part of this hour, I believe, we're going to look at some notes that I pulled out from when I was in school of ministry and some papers that I wrote, which are called response papers, which you're going to have a responsibility for writing, a response paper once every second hour, every even hour. This is the first hour, the next hour will be your second hour, you'll have a response paper due at the end of the second hour, the fourth hour, the sixth hour, the eighth hour, right on through the twentieth hour. So, I just want to encourage you to take the time and enjoy the blessing that the Lord has given you. Here you are, enrolled in a school of ministry, being taught by dedicated ministers of God's Word, ministers of the New Testament, New Testament ministers according to the Scriptures, to the Word of God. And you can study at your own pace. There are those that said, well, I can't go to school of ministry because I'm working and I can't make the classes. Well, now the classes are on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you study at your pace. There are others of you that said, I can't go to school of ministry because I can't afford it. The school of ministry has been 100% free of any cost, and so there's no reason for you to say, I can't study, I can't take the time, I, I don't have the time, or I don't have the money. Neither one of those are required. If you have, and I believe if you're watching this video, you have a desire to fulfill God's call on your life to minister God's Word and to minister it to others in a way that after receiving your ministry, they'll be able to minister to others after you. And so, just relax and enjoy this. Take the time to make it enjoyable. It is enjoyable studying and finding the truths of God's Word. So our class format is going to be, the class will be taught via 20 videotape lessons. The lessons will be available 24 hours a day, seven days per week on the internet. Each of the 20 lessons will be approximately 55 minutes in duration. 
there will be homework assignments, written assignments, a midterm exam, and a final examination. Now this syllabus that I'm reading is also going to be online. You want to go over it and see again what it is that, that you want to learn from this course? All you have to do is click on it. It's going to be right on the same page that the video tape lessons are on. All you have to do is click on it and read it, reread it. You can use it as a guideline for your study. Uh, the class description, the course covers the subject of prosperity from a biblical perspective, including definitions of prosperity in the, the lives of Old Testament patriarchs, uh, the covenants of promises, the principles of giving, stewardship, and how to handle wealth. Prosperity will be covered from an overall perspective, spiritual, physical, material, etc. We're just going to look at prosperity and to know so that you know that you know that you know that you know that it's God's will for you to prosper. It was God's will from the beginning and it's still his will now for mankind to prosper, to live in prosperity. Our class outline during the class the following subjects will be covered. And I want all of you to take notice of this because this is what we want to do. We want to make sure we follow the syllabus. We want to make sure that we're, we're faithful to what we said we were going to teach the students. And we say here that uh, uh, during this class we're going to study or look at or cover the following subjects. Biblical prosperity completely defined. We're going to look at the question, does God want his children to prosper? how to obtain complete prosperity, riches, positive and negative, spiritual prosperity, soulish prosperity, physical prosperity, relationship prosperity, material and financial prosperity, and prayer to obtain and maintain prosperity. Now, can we do all of those things? Can we teach this? We have enough ministers, don't we? But what I want to make sure is that we don't all teach the same aspect of it. So you might have a lesson that you've prepared already, and I'm going to speak to the ministers uh, afterwards, that you might have a lesson that already is prepared on one of these. You might have been studying ahead of time, making preparation ahead of time, and we can work together on this. That's the idea, isn't it? That we'd all work together and that we'll teach this subject to the students so they can in turn teach it to others. Now our class objective is upon completion of this course, each student will be expected to know and understand the following, that prosperity is for God's children, that prosperity covers the totality of man, how to obtain complete prosperity, and how to maintain a prosperous life in all areas. In every area of a person's life, God wants us to prosper. I think of the scripture that says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And the meaning of the very meaning of the words that God used for prosperity in the scriptures will let you know that God wants us to prosper in every way imaginable in every area of our lives, every day, every moment, every second of our lives, He wants us prosperous. There's no time that He doesn't want us prosperous. Now our class guidelines, each student, uh, each class video should be viewed and reviewed for scriptural references, studied until clearly understood. All assignments should be completed on time, with written assignments being submitted by email, that is the response papers that you're going to send, they'll be submitted by email, you'll receive your personal grades on your response papers and on your exams via email. And uh, the response paper, just to remind you, and I'm going to read a couple of them, that I wrote back in 1994. And just give you an example of where I was at that time that I was studying the class. 
and where you might find yourself, at least how you can get an idea of how to express both what you learned and what you expect or intend to do with what, you, what you've learned. And uh, these our class, under the class guidelines, we have some scriptures that I made note of. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study and be eager, and do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Now this isn't on your syllabus, but I just want to just encourage you by letting you know that if God called you to teach his children, to feed them the word of God, that it's something I know in my heart and I know from the scripture, God does not want us feeding his children junk food. He wants them to receive the best. So each one of us instructors should set it in our heart, I'm going to do everything I can to prepare a fine meal for God's children out of respect for our Heavenly Father, out of respect for our Lord Jesus, out of respect for the Holy Spirit. I don't want to get up and say the Holy Spirit is leading me and guiding me and then give a bunch of junk food. A bunch of things that just absolutely are not scriptural. That's what I'm saying. And uh, also from 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, it's, oh, it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now, if we were poor and he was rich and he's going to take on our poverty how poor were we? We're spiritually bankrupt. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't even take us in bankruptcy court say no you're just looking at you we can tell you're bankrupt and how rich was he? So if he became poor with our poverty and made us rich with his riches, how rich are we? That's something to ponder, isn't it? What kind of riches do we have? Or did he fail? Did he fail to take on our riches? I mean, our poverty? Did we fail to take on his riches? No, we didn't fail. He made us rich. But now, if we don't know we're rich, if we're still talking poor and acting poor and living poor in any area of our life, he didn't just become poor in finances. He became physically poor to the point that he that could not die suffered death. And is that what the scripture says? Even death on the cross? A horrible death, the death of a criminal. So it wasn't just that he became monetarily poor. He became physically poor. He became emotionally poor. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you think he was in torment emotionally? Under such stress and distress that he, he distress that he bled or sweated blood. You see, the poverty that, that we're talking about and the riches that we're talking about is complete and total riches in every area of our lives. And we'll see that as we go through the class by some of the words that God chose to use to describe our prosperity. And we'll know that he wants us prosperous in every area of our lives. And in 2 Chronicles 20.20, 20, 
it says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. So the prophet of God is going to speak the word of God. Amen. And it's because of the word of God, that same Jesus that became poor, is through the word of God that we have been made rich. And he sent his prophets, those that would speak forth the word of God, he sent you forth, he's sending you forth, to tell the people how prosperous they are because of the love of God for them. The love of God, the love of our Lord and our Savior. For God so what? Love the world. This is all about love. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight because without getting to a point of understanding of the love of God, you won't accept. People will hear you, but they will not accept the prosperity that Jesus became poor so that we could have. They won't accept that. Without understanding the fact that God loves them and loves them so much that he sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for their sins, they won't receive it because they'll still be believing the lie of Satan that their prosperity is based on their actions rather than on the actions of God because of his love for us. And, uh, he speaks of this in Romans 8.32. The scripture says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Freely give us. What are you going to compare to Jesus? What can we compare to that? And it's a question. You notice in the Bible that's a question. What shall we say to these things? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Question mark. What are you going to say to that? What are you going to compare Jesus to? Well, maybe we could compare him to ten gold planets. And God would say, oh, no, you can't have that. I gave you Jesus, but I'd never give you. No, there is no comparison. And that's what the Lord wants to get over. He said, if I didn't spare my own son for you, what is it I would cause you to have to buy, to pay for? But can we get that over to the students, to where they'll have faith in that, they'll have confidence in that? Well, that's what we're endeavoring to do, and that's what you're going to be doing as a result of taking this class. You're going to have your turn at that where you're doing what we're doing right now. And that's speaking to a lost and dying world, speaking to the body of Christ, speaking to the children of God, to get them to a place where they're willing to accept the fact that God wants them to live in prosperity in every area of their lives. And the last scripture that we have here is that these are our guidelines for our class and what we're going to use, the foundation scriptures that we're going to use. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things, above all what? Things. If it's a thing, God wishes above that. What things? The universe is a thing. He wishes above the whole universe. He wishes above all things that we prosper, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. So he wants us to prosper physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, materially. He wants us to prosper in every area of our lives. Well, I didn't just keep 
putting more and more scriptures there. We could I, it'd be, it'd have page after page of scriptures. If you start looking at all the scriptures that talks about the things God did for us to prosper, and he's talking about us pros prospering in every area of our lives, well, we'd have a manuscript. But that's for you to see. That's for you to research. That's for you to search out. That's for you to know. We'll guide you in your study, but this is only a guide. The scriptures are full of examples of God's dealing with man in such a way that man should prosper. It was his heart from the very beginning. When you think about the book of Genesis, that's the book of beginnings, right? And you go there and you see that God prepared a garden, the Garden of Eden, for the man. He didn't create the man and then tell the man to plant the plants here and there. He didn't tell the man to bury the jewels here and there. He didn't tell the man to put the gold over here and the silver over there. He didn't tell the man to do any of that. He prepared the garden for the man. Let's go there and look at that. We'll come right back to our syllabus. So let's stop take the time. Go over to Genesis. We'll see where we'll start reading. Someone hand me my glasses off the table back there, the, the red ones, so I can see this. Thank you. We'll start reading in. Uh, Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every, seed, every tree in the which is fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth on the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. What is it that God didn't give man? that he had created. All the animals, all the plants. You shall have dominion over what? All of the earth. The planet itself. Uh, let's go down. In verse 8, it said, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Who planted the garden? The Lord. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord, made the Lord God to grow every tree. Who made him grow? God did. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and a river went out 
of Eden to water the garden, who had to water the garden? The river watered it. He didn't tell Adam, you go out there and water the grass. He said, uh, to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pizan. That is it which compa compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. There's what? Gold. So God put gold in the garden. And the gold of the land is good. This was high quality stuff. <laughs> he didn't give him any cheap strain of gold. Said the gold was good. What does he need gold for? What does he need gold for? There's no stores. There's nothing to buy. Why? Why isn't it anything to buy? Because he provided everything. He owns it all. It's all been given to him. So the only reason for gold would then be what? The beauty of it. You ever think of that? The beauty of it. It's beautiful metal. And there is bedlam in the onyx stone. Bedlam is like a pearl. And I think most of us have seen Anik. And the name of the second river is Gihon, and it is that that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekal, that is, which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden to dress it and to keep it. He didn't tell the man to walk over there. <laughs> He told him, he put the man in the garden, didn't he? And he said, to keep it, to keep it means to protect it. That's where Adam fell down. He didn't protect it from Satan. And we might talk about that a little bit as a basis and foundation of where we want to go tonight. In verse 18, and we'll stop it there. And the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now, this does not say that God said it's not good for man to be single. You notice that? It says it's not good for man to be what? Alone. Alone. There's a difference in being alone and being single. And why? God didn't say it's not good for man to be single because it is good to be single. Because when something is single, it is total, it is whole, it is complete. Adam was complete. And so this is something to both the men and the women. If you're trying to get married or hooked up with someone because you don't feel as though you are complete when you're single, you don't need to be marrying anyone. Did you hear what I said? Because if you're looking for someone else to complete you, you've missed it and they can't do it. We've been made complete in Christ Jesus. And so if they're not complete, they're not in Christ Jesus. And the Word of God says for us not to be unequally yoked. The perfect marriage is when you can find someone that is complete. You find someone that is single. They're complete. Oh, I'm going to make him a real man. Well, you're going to have yourself a real good failure. If he's not already complete, you need to hook him up with Jesus. Because we're made complete in Christ Jesus. If she's not already complete, I'm going to make her. Well, you need to get her to receive Jesus. And let her become complete. And then when two complete people get together, 
they can have a marriage that lasts all of their lives because they find their fullness in Christ Jesus. If they're waiting to be fulfilled by you, you're going to let them down because you can't do it. They're made whole in Christ Jesus. Now you know the best time to find this out? Before you get married. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so you, but see the good news is that if you find this out after you get married, you can still lead them to becoming complete or you can become complete yourself in Christ Jesus, in the Word of God. And so it's not a helpless or hopeless situation, but it'd be better to start it off right, wouldn't it? and not go through the grief of trying to become complete or helping someone else to become complete when you could have started off with two complete people. Where were we? We were on our syllabus with the course requirements. It says successfully complete all reading assignments, written assignments, response papers, both the midterm and final examinations within the prescribed time. And like I said before, that will be posted on the, the uh, internet, the due dates for your, your response papers and for your midterm exam and final examination. And the response papers will be 10 papers due in the course of a 20-week course, a 20-hour course. There will be 10 response papers due. <coughs> Each one of them will be worth one point. Your midterm exam will be worth 40 points. Your final exam will be worth 50 points. And a passing grade will be 70 points or higher. Your due dates, like I said, will be assigned. And our bibliography for this course is the Holy Bible. And you use whatever version or translation of the Bible that you want. Uh, some I believe are better than others, better translations than others, but you is the one that you can read and understand, the one that you have faith for. Now, uh, I was going to do this at the end of the class, but I think I'm going to share with you uh, now from uh, one or two, maybe even three, uh, two of the response papers that uh, I wrote in the same class on Biblical Prosperity in 1994. Uh, and the first one under what I learned, uh, my understanding of any Biblical subject should be based on the foundation of the Bible. In studying Biblical Prosperity, I will use the definition of riches to mean abundantly supplied to the point of having the ability to give away where I'm lacking nothing and all my needs are met. God's word lets me know that it has been his desire for man to prosper from the beginning, and that is why he gave dominion, gave man dominion in the earth realm. I understand through the knowledge of God's covenants that God restored me to a position of prosperity by giving me all that he has through the new covenant written in the blood of Jesus Christ. I have learned that to fully understand covenant and my covenant's rights, I must have an understanding of my righteousness. God's word always shows that God's promise, promises to bless, that God promises to bless those who follow and obey him. And he has always prospered those who follow him. The plan of God has always been for his people to prosper. However, Satan has perverted the plan of God and prospers those who follow him. The church needs to be set free <coughs> excuse me, from the bondage of Satan's perversions of God's plan to prosper the body of Christ. The church can be set free if it is taught to delight itself in the Lord. 
And this can be accomplished when the body of Christ has an understanding of righteousness. In Psalms 37, 4, it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. When God comes on the scene, Christians have biblical prosperity, and Jesus is lifted up to his fullest, Jesus is lifted up to his fullest extent. And I must show biblical prosperity in my own life. Now, how am I applying what I have learned? As a person called by God to teach his word, I am applying what I have learned to my own life. I'm claiming my covenant rights as I learn them and understand God's word and his plan for my life. I have made a personal commitment to show that God's word works. I believe that if God's word does not work in my life, I should not be teaching others. I realize that if God's word is not working in my life, it is because I'm not applying his, God, his word correctly or not applying his word in faith. I don't feel that I can tell others that Jesus came so that they could have life and have it more abundantly if I'm living below my covenant rights and not living an abundant life. I'm blessed to be attending a Holy Spirit directed school taught by spirit-filled teachers who teach the uncompromised Word of God. The Word of God says that his people perish for a lack of knowledge. My lack of knowledge is being cured. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. I'm being fed the meat of the word under a pastor that has shown through his personal life that the word of God works. And I am fully persuaded that the word will work and is working in my life. And understanding that God has a plan for my life and that it is established in the new covenant and everything outside of God's plan is a part of Satan's plan for my life. And I am persuaded to make a quality decision to follow God's plan for my life. I will not subscribe to, to Satan's plan of worry, sickness, poverty, helplessness, and despair when God's plan assures me of biblical prosperity i.e. spiritual prosperity, mental and emotional prosperity, material and financial prosperity, and successful interpersonal relationships. Well, that was a little longer than what we're requiring of you because this is two pages and all you have to do is write a one-page response paper. But I can testify to you that even though I wrote this on April the 18th, 1994, that by following what I said that I intended to do with the Word of God that I can say today with no reluctance at all that I am prosperous in every area of my life. And the reason that I'm prosperous is because I took these words that I had written, I stuck to them and I stick to them today. But it's something here that I want to bring out that you might not understand the importance of at this point. And that is, let me see if I can find it here and read it again for you again. I have an understanding that God has a plan for my life that is established in the new covenant. I knew back then that there was something in the new covenant that we needed to and that you need to and that you need to teach others that is not in the old covenant. It's just not there. I have a greater understanding now of the importance of the new covenant than I had when I wrote this in 1994. The Lord has continued to give and continues to give more and more revelation about the importance of the new covenant. If you're going to walk in prosperity, 
mentally, physically, emotionally, morally, relationally, financially. Did I mention that? Financially. If you're going to walk in prosperity in every area of your life, you, as a minister of God's Word, should set your heart to be a minister according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 6. I want us to go there, and I want us to read that. And then maybe we'll talk about that just, just for a few minutes. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I believe it's verse 6. Well, we'll read into it so you'll have some context. Uh, the Apostle Paul is, is, is writing. And we'll start in verse 5. He wants us to know, and I want you to know, that I'm not saying this has anything to do with any special innate ability within me or within you. This is the power of the Holy Ghost. This is the heart of God being ministered through the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is making that clear, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to thank anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So it's God has made us, he had that word, if you look it up, study this out, know that you know that you know that you know that you've checked these things out. You didn't just listen to Pastor Stewart. You listened to the Holy Spirit, you went to the Word of God, you checked out, what does it mean he has made us able? If you look it up, you'll find he has given us the ability, he has enabled us. This isn't something you get on your own. This is something you get from the very power of God to do this. And what was it he empowered us or enabled us to do? To be able ministers of a new covenant based on better promises. Now I want to give you a picture of this that the Lord has given me just recently. And I'm going to do my best to explain it in a way that you can picture it so you get an understanding of it. But to help me with this explanation, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to start reading in verse 8. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on the good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 11. Now this is why we came over here. It says, wherefore remember. Wherefore do what? Remember. He wants you to remember this. He wants me to remember this. I take the time to remember this. It says, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in flesh made by hands. It's saying, you're called a Gentile or a heathen by the people that are the children of Israel who have been circumcised. They call you the uncircumcision, they call you Gentiles, they call you heathens. In the letter here, the epistle here, we're called Gentiles. It says in verse 12 that at that time, what time? That in times past, so the people he's talking to, are not in the state that they were in before. He says, remember that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, 
and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So here is the Gentile before he is saved. He says that he's strangers. He says you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, I mean you were not a descendant of Israel. Now if you were, this isn't applying to you. You have another something you have to read in here, but right now we're talking to those who were, who were Gentiles. That's what the scripture is speaking to, is speaking to the Gentiles. You get an understanding of that. So if you're, if you're, if you're a descendant of Israel, you just listen. This doesn't apply to you. It says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. We're going to read a little further, but I want you to get a picture of this. We talked about Adam. Adam was in the garden. He was created in the image and likeness of God. He fellowship with God in the cool of the day. He walked in the light of God's word. The light of the God's word, if you read in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, you'll find out that Jesus was the light of the world, was the life, and him was life, and that life was the light of the world, and he is the light. He said that he lights every man. If you're in Christ, you're illuminated. If you're out of Christ, you're in the darkness. So here's Adam, he's walking in the light every day with God. He falls. He sins. He's separated from God. He's now been translated from the kingdom of light into the kingdom of darkness. You got the picture? So where is Adam located? The kingdom of darkness. In darkness. Mankind is now in darkness. God takes a group of people, the children of Israel, and he says, he goes, he started this with Abram, when he said, Abram, as for me, I'm coming to you because God said, I've got something I want to do in the earth realm. That's why I'm coming to you. Abram didn't get to God because he went to God. God went to Abram. You have to read this in Genesis. You want to get a picture of this and realize this is the living reality, the truth of God's word, that if you live outside of that truth, you will never understand God. You will never understand his love for you. You'll never understand your prosperity, your healing. None of the word of God will make sense to you. It will just be a bunch of religious something that you talk about on Sunday, maybe. Depending on what church you're attending. But here, you got the picture now. God takes and goes to a certain man and says, I've got something I want to do in the earth realm. I want to work through you. That man, Abram, believed God and God accounted it to him for righteousness. It did not say Abraham was righteous. It said God treated him because you believe me, I'm going to treat you as though you are in right standing with me. Abram and Abraham were still as spiritually dead as Adam and all of the descendants of man. But God went to this one dead man and said, I'm going to treat you and your descendants as if you were alive. So here God, we have Adam and all the descendants of Adam. Where are they located? In the darkness. 
They're all in the darkness. God has this dispensation of time that he works with the children, the descendants of Israel, as if they were in the light. He gives them rules, the covenants of promise. He gives them rules in this covenant of promise that if they will follow these rules, they will be blessed. The children in the darkness, it says you were in the world. Let me read it again. It says you were in the world. At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of, of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You don't have any promises. You have no hope. And you're without God in the world. So here they still are. We see in the scriptures that in Adam all died. Don't we see that? These people are still dead. They're still in the darkness. God works with Israel, the children of Israel. One, he's making a way to help these people that are in the world with no God and no hope. Through Jesus, he makes a way for the people that are in the dark to come to the light. So if you can picture that a doorway shut when Adam sinned, the way to the tree of life was cut off by angels. Isn't that right? And the life was the light of men. They could not get to the light. They're in the darkness. The door is shut. Jesus is the door. But he's not the door that's shut. He's the door that opened. And it's when we enter in through Christ Jesus that we enter into the light and we're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But we didn't go through this section here in the middle. The laws had nothing to do to us or with us. Isn't it? Didn't we just read that? You were aliens from the covenants of promise. We were in the world with no hope and no God. We were spiritually dead. But Satan's plan to get us out of prosperity when we're over here, over here when we walk through the door, we're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We still don't go through this middle area. Didn't you remember reading there's a wall of partition God had to take down? We were partitioned off. But Satan through religion has got us through religion, even though we're in the kingdom of light, he's got us turning around trying to operate in this area that we have no blessings, we have no hope, we have no covenant, trying to fulfill the very laws that the children of Israel could not fulfill. They lived in death. The word that was supposed to be life for them proved to be death. Not that the word, the law wasn't good. The law was good. It was perfect. That's why it was death to man. They couldn't keep it. And the law has no ability. The law that says don't drive 40 miles an hour on this 30 mile zone, that law has no ability to make you drive 30. Laws have no ability to make you obey them. So Jesus obeyed the law for us so that we could be translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light without ever going through this area that we've been partitioned from. So now, your challenge is not to get in this Old Testament, the Old Covenant. That's why he made you an able minister of the New Covenant, the New Testament. Not to get the people back here, not for you to run back here to find some good sermon. It's only given as an example to the children of light so that we won't fall prey to the same lust that the children of Israel did, which caused them to die. 
God wants us blessed. And because of our time, we're going to have to continue this in our next hour. So I want you to just relax, go over this, go to the scriptures, look at what we've just been talking about. Look at the scriptures that said, in Christ all have died, in Christ all shall be made alive, can be made alive. We had nothing to do with the commonwealth of Israel. Don't let others get you steeped in a ministry of death when you've been made able, you are able, if God has called you, to minister the new covenant. And we'll continue this in our next lesson.